With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Hell. Ah, uh, it's twice on Sunday. This is Heard Tell Show's uh, recap of the week that was. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you and yours are. We hope you're well, whether you're across the street or around the world. Five great interviews this week. Very proud to bring you all of them. We're going to kick it off with Kerr Nuthi. She joined us and talked a little internet regulation. She has studied and lived both overseas and in the States. So we discussed that. We compare and contrast Europe, the EU, and England since breakfast, how they innovate, how they don't innovate, and how they regulate, how America innovates and regulates the internet and high tech, and how those things go together. Kernuthi on the Hertel program right now. I was shocked about this. When you were writing about this, um, you had this stat, and this blew me away. Spotify is the only top 30 tech company based in the EU. That that can't be true. I mean, that just doesn't even sound right, does it? It doesn't. And it's it's really interesting considering that like the startup and scale up culture of Europe and the United Kingdom post Brexit are both ramping up. It just seems off that it's just Spotify by market capitalization. Um, but I think that's a sign of how light touch regulation or um, the way that American tech companies have been able to succeed is working. Light touch regulation made it so that an awkward statement like Spotify is really the only large competitive tech company, according to market cap, is possible. And it's because one side of the Atlantic had light touch regulation that let these companies have low barriers to entry and focus on innovation and disrupting this, just disrupting the status quo. Whereas the other side had already heightened barriers to entry and already had a lot of hurdles that startups and companies have to just get past to even be competitive in the international environment. And that is what the internet is. It's an international environment. These companies have global reaches sometimes. And because they have global reaches, a European company is going to compete with American ones and American ones going to compete with Asian ones. It's so interesting, though, because th- this isn't like we're talking about, you know, developing nations here. Uh, Germany, France, sweet. Germany's one of the world leaders in industrial technology. They're, they're on the cutting edge of that. Most of the world goes there for things like, you know, precision tooling, things like this that you need for industrial thing. You know, Switzerland, of course, well, world renowned for their banking and their financing stuff. The Netherlands, Spain, Sweden. These aren't developing countries. These are what we would consider frontline economies, top countries in the world, countries that are mostly uh, market-based systems that we think of as being pretty free. The idea that there isn't a major tech company in a Germany or in a Switzerland or even in an England, you know, London's the financial center of the world in a lot of cases, as we've learned with the Russian stuff, that, that's just shocking to me. But is that not a perfect example of what a little bit of regulation can do, because we've all seen the European websites where we got to click those extra cookie things, right? And that's not exactly analogous, but it's just an example. Is there any other way to explain that but regulation? Because they innovate in everything else. They just don't seem to be innovating in this. I mean, you're seeing that now post-Brexit. The United Kingdom post-Brexit is outpacing Germany, France, Sweden, all of these countries for like startup investment, venture capital, et cetera. Like, it's become a real contender and it's going to be really interesting to see in the coming years if that works out for the United Kingdom because they've maintained the approach that makes them more marketable than Europe. But that's the exact reason why the UK was even able to outpace European countries is their regulatory system, especially their data privacy GDPR, has made it not the most friendly area for tech companies to want to go to or start their business. And that's just the nature of free markets and competition. While the European Union may want a heavily regulated environment, and maybe that is what they want, and maybe that isn't what they want, but that's what they have. Um, Companies can just go elsewhere. So can investors. And while customers can probably not move as easily as 
companies and investment, it's going to always be more consumer friendly and more investment friendly, more innovation friendly, where there is less regulation. Now, you you went to school in London. You went to University College of London. You know London well. London is an international city. It's the financial hub for most of the world. It's also a cultural hub. It's an, there's the running joke that all the most expensive real estate in London, none of it is owned by the English. It's all you know, rich people from elsewhere coming in. Talk about the environment, though. Like, Do people in London, do they go, well, wait a minute, we're a financial center. We're one of the great cities in the world. Shouldn't we have this? Or is that something that the people think of? And therefore, because it's a parliamentarian system, the government is just kind of lagging behind it, or is the government ahead of the people there in England? I I don't know myself, actually. I think what we're seeing in the UK is they want to start this digital markets unit to create regulation, um, and they want to force the competitive markets authority to be a little bit more aggressive than maybe it was in the past. But it's interesting. I feel like when I lived there um, and just in general, London is an incredibly unique city um, just because it is so large and holds so many industries and just so many different like sectors of talent. Um, but for the United Kingdom, it seems to be that they're pushing for regulation after having to figure out what the regulatory scheme looks like, especially for digital markets. Welcome back to Twice on Sunday, Hertel's recap show. Uh, one of our favorites, we have her on all the time, our historian friend from over in England, Sarah Stook, uh, writing in electionsdaily.com, our good friends over there. They have these wonderful history pieces she's doing. She's currently doing a series on the first ladies of the United States of America. Fascinating stuff. An interesting way to look at our presidents, as we talked about with her. The fact this kind of normalizes them. We tend to kind of think about the marble busts and the statues and the mythology and the history of these presidents. But looking at it through the lens of the first ladies, you kind of get an interpersonal relationship of it. These were people. They had to interact with each other. And these are remarkable women who had a great effect on the history of our country. Some surprising facts you may or may not know about. Some things that may or may not have changed the course of the history of the whole country, like we talk about in this clip right here. Sarah Stuck, one of our favorites, talking about the first ladies of the United States of America right now. I found um, when you wrote about it, a president we don't talk about a whole lot, Rutherford B. Hayes, his wife, Lucy, um, we talk about, you know, nowadays we use the term activist a lot. She really was an activist in a lot of cases. And then she had to kind of adapt herself to the politics of the day and the White House. And she still seemed to have a very strong relationship with her husband. Talk about Lucy Hayes a little bit. Yeah, everyone just mocks her as Lemonade Lucy, who, you know, didn't allow wine at the White House, et cetera. I mean, we've still had two two taller presidents. You know, Trump didn't. He saw his brother die from alcoholism. Bush suffered from alcoholism and now is doesn't drink. But back then, you know, prohibition, temperance was extremely popular, especially among women. They saw husbands coming home drunk and idle, beating their wives and not working and thought, you know, this is a societal problem. And she was far from the only one. And she was extremely intelligent. First lady to go to college, she was extremely intelligent, so much so that Rutherford B. Hayes was both ad admired her and was a bit scared of her for being so intelligent she probably would have got um supported to women's suffrage if she'd lived longer or been a different time period she wasn't absolutely perfect on race but she definitely was very strongly abolitionist and spoke out for civil rights she was a pretty remarkable lady who's just gone down to oh she didn't like to drink and she was a she's the forebearer. Before her, first ladies were maybe very intelligent, but they weren't, you know, highly educated as it wasn't expecting women to. But look, several of our most recent first ladies have either got law degrees, PhD, or, or graduates. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Uh talking to Sarah Stuck, a little bit of history. Okay, here's one that I love and I've actually studied a little bit. Uh Julia Grant. 
Uh, Grant, of course, speaking of drinking problems, Grant had himself one. Uh, Lincoln famously told when the generals tried to get him fired, get Grant fired, he famously quipped that we'll find out whatever brand he's drinking and I'll give him more and give it to all the other generals because he fights. Uh, but when you look at history, the only time Grant drank was when his wife wasn't around. Uh, it's very amazing relationship. Julia Dent was her maiden name. Talk about her uh, very fascinating woman, her family background. And then she got connected to Ulysses S. Grant, who, <laughs> to, to put it kindly, was a failure at pretty much everything he did that did not involve the army until the Civil War kind of revived his life. Talk about her a little bit. You know, she was born pretty much to refinement. Her family owned slaves. You know, she grew up very pampered and well off, but she always said, you know, she had a very happy childhood. Um, her brother was at West Point with Grant and said, you need to meet this guy. I think you would get along. But obviously they clearly did because they got married. But his parents wouldn't attend the wedding because they were staunch abolitionists. And one of the um, very few presidential parents or couples who were still alive when the son became president. So they said, oh, you're marrying into a slave owning family. We've got nothing against Julia. She's fine. But we don't want you marrying into that. And conversely, his father-in-law liked him but said, I don't think you can provide my daughter in the way I want. And during the Civil War, when he offered Grant, you know, come to the Confederacy and Grant said no, Mr. Dent just was um, didn't break off ties because he was so close to Julia. Now, when he gets to the White House, um, Ulysses S. Grant, of course, the great war hero, uh, very troubled presidency, a lot going on. In fact, uh, the term for corruption in the White House for decades after that was Grantism. Uh, some of that's unfair. Some of it is fair. We can parse that out some other time. Uh, but a tumultuous presidency for somebody who was kind of a living legend. How did she handle her actual time in the White House? You know, she obviously her husband was very much known for his corruption, she said, and probably only skated through it because he was a war hero. She just said, OK, I'll ignore it. And she just got on with it, which, to be fair, there's not really what she can do about it. She may be associated with him because his wife, but she's not political. So she's safe in that respect. So she just sort of got on with it, as many first ladies do. You know, look at Hillary Clinton during the impeachment and the Lewinsky scandal. She just said, OK, I'm just going to crack on with being first lady. And that's sort of a hallmark of many first ladies going through very hard times without problems and that's probably how she was raised you know you've got a wife and a mother never perturbed by anything and famously grant uh was practically broke when he died but he was fighting throat cancer there's a famous picture of him sitting on the porch in the adirondacks writing his memoirs one of the great memoirs by the way if you've never read grant's memoirs go find it read it but he finished them right at the time of his death and it restored his family's fortune and she had quite the post White House career. She kind of became sort of a conciliary to future first ladies, the Cleveland she was very close to. She had a very, very successful post White House career, advocacy wise, and just being kind of a, a who's who in the Washington circles, wasn't she? I think, you know, when I write about write about her, there was just so much I wanted to give in, but you know, you couldn't do a whole piece on it. And there's probably first ladies I'll write about in the future, the ones like Jackie Kennedy, who I just read a biography of her who had the most amazing post White House life, Hillary Clinton, you know, her political career. There's so much you want to, you know, jam into it because, well, there's so much to do. But it's an article about first ladies. So to be fair to them, I will write about more what they did in their time as first lady, but we may be associated Hillary Clinton more with politics, but you know, Julia Grant, she will always most likely be a first lady as opposed to anything but. Yeah. All right. I've been saving it because this is one of my favorite things you wrote in the first four series of this, but you talked about it before. Uh, Mary Todd Lincoln was a little hard to get along with. You talked about that ride, the, the her excoriating the general's wife for riding too close to Lincoln. Julia Grant was there for that. She saw that. She tried to intervene. She got her head bit off. And that kind of intersected with one of the most famous things that has ever happened in American history, didn't it? Well, in April 1865, they invited the Grants to come to the theater with them. Ulysses says Grant was probably all for it, but Julia Grant said, no, I can't stand her. It will be boring. Let's stay at home. We've been apart for too long. Let's just have some time together. And that night, Lincoln was shot. 
So A, Grant could have been shot or B, maybe could have prevented it because he said if I'd been there, there would have been a lot more, you know, bodyguards and military. So, you know, he, she basically saved his life and I bet she never shut up about that during arguments, did she? Uh, Welcome back to Twice on Sunday, Heard Tell's recap show. Very, very proud of this interview. You know, we talk about turning down the noise. We talk about actively listening to all sides and then making decisions. We're going to talk, not yell. We're not just going to chase buzzwords. Uh, We're very proud of this interview. Uh, West Virginia delegate Danielle Walker joined us. We were so thrilled to get her and to have this conversation with her. We talk about some really tough issues. Uh, She was very gracious in her time. She talked through those tough issues. If you've never heard somebody out on issues like CRT, like the Crown Act, like race, like discrimination, and you've only heard the buzzwords online from your own side, this is an interview you need to listen to in its entirety. We actively listen. We talk. We ask some very tough questions, some very direct questions. She answered them all. Very humble and grateful for her time. Please seek out this entire interview, but especially this clip powerful stuff. It gets emotional. It gets real. And it's something that we don't see enough in our media of people just talking to each other. So a great grown folk talk with West Virginia delegate Danielle Walker right now on her tell. A, a tough topic. We'll just touch on it briefly, though. But uh, education has been a lot of people's mind. There was an education bill that uh, went forward in West Virginia. It's let's call it what it is. It's dead identical to about 20 other states is because these are all kind of coming from the same places. The CRT debate got flopped over top of the whole thing because that's the buzzword one and that's the one that gets fundraising and that's the one that gets attention. Put this, let's do this like we did the hair thing though. Put it on a personal level though, because for folks that don't know, in the state of West Virginia, every eighth grader, including me, including everybody else that was in eighth grade, you have to take a semester of West Virginia history. All Mm -hmm. right. Love it. It's called the Golden Horseshoe. I was robbed in 92, but let's not get into that. Um, when, When you deal with history, when I took West Virginia history, there just wasn't a lot. There, the hidden figures thing I didn't know about, even though I grew up an hour from there. Uh, the Hawks Nest Tunnel disaster. I bet a lot of people don't know about that. Hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of black men from the South purposely recruited without families that died on that mountain. Uh, the mines were the same way in a lot of cases back in the days, places like Welch down in the coal field. There's a, some of it's dark, but it's a very rich history that doesn't get taught. But because they're legislating on the bill, and I'm, I'm just going to put it this way, part of my problem with the CRT legislation is you, legislation has to be black and white, and these folks can't even define what CRT is, pro and con. You're writing bills now where I think you're going to have a big problem teaching much of anything. Is that how it landed with you, too? Because you have a perspective that I don't have. You tell me. How should we be addressing these issues? Because I know for a fact, because I grew up in West Virginia and I came through West Virginia in schools. They don't teach this stuff, and I doubt it's gotten a whole lot better. Uh, how do we make it better without having this nebulous legislation that's just going to kind of muddle the water on everything at best and harm things at worse? The best way that we can go through this is to lean on the professionals that are in the classroom, and that is our educators. And our educators have master's degrees in doctrine in the classroom. There is always an open line of communication. My family moved here in 2010. My oldest son, my late son, was an eighth grader. All of us learned that eighth grade history. What we did not learn was Katherine Johnson, Carter G. Woodson, the father of Black History Month, never came across that. We didn't learn about Booker T. Washington, Harper's Ferry. We did not know of the many festivals. We hadn't heard about the Osage community that's right here in Montegalia County. And so why do we want history to remain hidden? And what is that going to really do for the students of West Virginia? Presentation without presence is powerless. And we are all power. Now, when we speak about certain things of 
migration and immigration and slave trade and civil rights, even to modern day, and we speak about lynching, you, you can't forget about Emmett Till. And I do my due diligence especially doing Black History One, is to pick up, I just didn't pick up any Black history. I chose West Virginia Black history for a reason. And to have my friend, my colleague, a Republican from the Charleston area, Delegate Pack says, I learn something every time you post something. And it's on Twitter. So it's just one, two sentences. That's it. He said, and I've lived here all my life. I'm going to go back and take a ride through Charleston again. If we can start being open-minded, I don't want you to feel anything, but I don't want you to disregard the generational trauma. Most hurtful is removing books about Ruby Bridges, Martin Luther King Jr., and Galileo, from certain school libraries, I have a problem with that because that's the first persons that you use to quote. Katherine Johnson is an honorable American just as Robert C. Byrd is. But you see Robert C. Byrd named on many hospitals all over roads, bridges, but Katherine Johnson had to hit the big screen for you to know her name, not even remember it. 36 things in the state of West Virginia with Robert C. Byrd's name on it. For those of you keeping score at home, talking to Danielle Walker, I, w- I want to ask you this question. It's a little indelicate, but I'm just going to phrase it to you the way you said it. Yes. Um, let me phrase it to you this way. Um, because the response to this is, I've heard it from friends on the right and the left, some of them too. They say, well, this just makes it too uh, controversial. We want to have a colorblind society. We want to treat everybody equally. You had a quote when you were speaking to a crowd. It was actually during a rally back about two years ago. And I wanted to ask you about this because the way you phrased it, I want you to explain it to, to me and the folks in the audience as well. You said, and I'm paraphrasing it just a bit, you said um, the problem with being colorblind is if everybody's colorblind, then they'll never actually see me. What is it you meant by that, that they won't see you? It, because it sounds good. We want to live in a colorblind society. We want everybody to be equal. But what does that mean to you when you say, well, then they don't see me? Does that tie into all that history we were just talking about? It does. And it goes back. And I may get a little emotional. It goes back to being three and a half years old, when my mother and father sat me down and said I had three strikes against me. Now, please don't judge my parents because I love them dearly. Number one, you're black. Number two, you're a female. And number three, I'm sorry, baby, we are poor. I didn't use those things as an excuse. I didn't use those things to keep my head down. I used those three strikes to motivate me because my parents were realist, right? So that meant for every application, it asked about my race. How can we have a colorblind society? Whether I apply for a job, whether I'm getting a driver's license, it is a marker of who I am, race. And so why, where does the color blindness come from? Now, many folks it could say that this is my religion, this is what's in the Bible. Well, then that's discriminatory also because not everyone practices a religion. Not everyone reads the Bible. It is my faith, and I hold it near and dear to my heart. But when you say you want to be colorblind, do you blind out my natural hair? When you say you want to be colorblind, do you blind out 
my tattoos. When you say you want to be colorblind, do you take away my statute of being a six foot, 300 pound woman? Do you go colorblind if you see my sons walking into a store and you clutch your purse? Do you go colorblind when you see certain people wear certain clothes, listening to certain music? So when are we actually truly colorblind? We are human. So I need you to see me. I need you to see beyond this beautiful black skin that I was so graciously, graciously blessed to be in. I need you to see the mind. I need you to not only hear the words that's coming out my mouth, but I want you to understand them. I want you to be an active listener. I want us to work together. I don't want a hand out. I need a hand up at times, but just as I'm reaching my hand up for you to help me, my other hand is reaching for someone else to come to that same level. This is true equity, but we can't ask for di diversity, equity and inclusion if you're not seeing me. So I need you to see me, all of me. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Uh, Russia and Ukraine has been dominating both the news and our little program. We've talked about it just about every day in the 40 some odd days since Russia's illegal, immoral and ghastly invasion of Ukraine. But what set some of this off, of course, was the energy pro policy over there, especially natural gas. That's what fuels the oligarchs. That's what fuels Putin's power is their gas and natural resources and the way they can hold that over Europe's head. Uh, we turn to one of another of our great Young Voices contributors. Lindsay Kaiser was on the program. A wonderful conversation, wide ranging, talking about Gazprom, the Russian energy giant that is the bankroll for the oligarchs and all the mess that Putin does over there. But we also talk about things like infrastructure here in America, pipelines, ports, how now that our president has gone over there and wanting to increase our exports, which is a good thing. There's also policies that should have been done for a long time in the past to get us ready to be able to do that and how the current crisis should shape our policy and our thoughts going forward. So we're better prepared for the next one. Lindsay Kaiser talking gas, talking energy, talking policy and a little bit of infrastructure to boot on her tell right now. You mentioned a minute ago, let's talk infrastructure here for a minute, because we have seven uh, liquefied right. natural gas processing plants on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast um, for obvious reasons, because <laughs> when we're talking about pipelines in America, pipelining that stuff to the ports is the part of that that you need to really export this energy. So now that they want, we mentioned the deal for 15 uh, billion cubic meters of gas going to Europe, yeah. they want to scale that up to 50 billion by next year. But to really do stuff like that, you have to have the pipeline infrastructure and you have to have the port infrastructure. And this isn't Biden's fault because he's only been in office for years. We have neglected this kind of infrastructure for decades for various reasons, from economical to political to environmental. Sure. These are the things that you have to be doing all the time ahead of time, because when the crisis comes, they're years away and it could have been a solution right now, isn't it? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're right, of course, that the lack of pipeline infrastructure is something that has sort of dominated American energy policy since long before President Biden was in office. Um, but it certainly doesn't help that he has fought tooth and nail to keep the Keystone XL pipeline closed, um, something that a lot of you know congressmen have fought to reopen, um, including Congressman Pete Stauber from Minnesota. Um, and, you know, the thing about reopening Keystone XL is that it would really improve natural gas availability in the U.S., um, and it would also help Europe avoid, you know, supporting a brutal regime to maintain its own energy security. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a tough look. And it's also interesting because it goes back to this thing about optics, right? It's like, okay, so you really do want to help Western Europe get its oil and gas, um, you know, imported from the U.S. That's fantastic. And yet you won't support the infrastructure that's necessary in order to make that pipeline, you know, dream like a reality. 
we talk about the pipelines and I understand there's environmental concerns. Um, yeah. But when w- the pipelines, though, and I know they, there can be leaks and things like that. The, the idea of the pipelines is you get it off the roads and you don't have to truck this stuff and it flows right. smoother. There, there's environmental and car. In fact, the, the one that they were trying to put through Appalachian, that would have been carbon neutral if that's something you're really worried about the way they had designed that one. It is more environmentally friendly. At some point, perfect becomes the enemy of the good on the environmental stuff on this stuff with the pipelines. And I'm, I'm, look, they just tried to put, they're putting one through West Virginia right now. There's parts of West Virginia I don't want a pipeline through because, you know, I'm literally where I grew up. They got (laughs) my hometown right now. They got them just stacked up, all the pipeline stuff. I get all that. But then the opposite side of that is we we live in a globally unified world now. And yes, right. when Russia invades Ukraine, now we're going to pay for it because we didn't have our up. Where do you think we find that balance? Because there, there, I don't want to blow it off because there's legitimate environmental concerns with pipelines. There's economical sure. concerns with pipelines. But there's also this alternative of if you make yourself dependent on bad people at some point, it is going to burn you. At some point, we got to make some compromises here somewhere, don't we? Absolutely. And I think, you know, one funny thing that something you mentioned reminded me of is that President Biden has gone on to say to meet with, um, I believe it's Saudi officials um, and other officials in Middle Eastern countries about securing more oil and natural gas resources. Um, And it sort of makes you wonder, you know, are these the nations that we'd like to pair up with? If we if pairing up with Russia, right, resulted in an invasion of Ukraine, um, and now we want to go pair up with the Middle East, not exactly a very democratically friendly place, not exactly a place that cares a lot about the environment, historically speaking, um, instead of, you know, making sure that if we if we pipe this oil and gas at home, we can put on our own environmental controls. Right. If we produce it at home, you know, refine it at home, we can control the way that it would impact the environment much more than if we just buy it from somebody else. So. I that's you know I think it's another question another question that goes into understanding the balance between Im- improving domestic energy supply or buying it elsewhere and not having that environmental burden on our own land. See I like the way you put it is important too because you wrote about this when you were writing an international policy digest about natural gas being America's greatest weapon weapon <laughs> kind of a you know an analogy there Right. But it really is the case here because Putin has weaponized his energy sector. Uh, we already know the mess we've been in the Middle East for decades and decades over oil. Um, at some point, clean energy will be weaponized by people. It, I fear it will be because China dominates the raw minerals that we need to make batteries for all this electrical vehicle. The idea Absolutely. that these things are not going to be weaponized at some point is foolish. Shouldn't we treat resources like natural gas like you know the raw minerals that are needed for batteries for the EV stuff that's coming in the future, right? Shouldn't we treat these things as strategically important geopolitically and not? Just, I think we compartmentalize this stuff too much. Like, well, this is an energy issue or this is an environmental issue. Shouldn't this be more of a holistic? May not be the right term, but this stuff all goes together. Shouldn't we approach it that way so that we're seeing it in a healthier manner? Of like, look, we need to make a little bit of a compromise on the environmental part of this. And we're going to make a little bit of a compromise on this because we're going to keep us out of a geopolitical war. Shouldn't we be thinking yeah. about it more that way instead of just getting in our niche little policy sectors and not putting it all together into a complete picture? Absolutely. Absolutely, Andrew. And it's funny, I don't think anything has made that more clear than the Russian invasion of Ukraine that we are seeing reflected in prices for energy you know, to heat our homes and gasoline to power our cars. I think the fact that this is a geopolitical issue is, is you know, reflected in those higher prices that Americans are paying every single day. Um, even though we have not sent any troops to Ukraine, we have sent limited military weaponry to Ukraine, if that, and we've sent maybe humanitarian aid. That's about it. Um, and the president said, you know, we aren't going to get fully involved. And yet it feels like everyone's fully involved in this crisis, just given, you know, the, the skyrocketing inflation. Um, and higher prices for energy at home and for our cars. So, yeah, I think it's more evident now than ever that energy, you know, and whether it's clean, nuclear, you know, oil, gas, even coal, um, it's it's a geopolitical issue. It's not just an environmental issue or um, an energy, you know, only issue. Let's we've talked about the big picture. And let's take this down to the, the people level, the personal level. 
Um, something that I'm concerned about and a lot of other people are, this looks like it's going to be a long war, especially with the redeployment that the Russians are, they're not retreating their redeployment folks. Don't let anybody tell you different. Uh, this is going to be a long <laughs> war. Um, again, this is 40% of the energy that, especially the natural gas that Europe needs. Go look at a map. Uh, Europe is on the longitude with Maine. They're a lot more North of us. Winter is a right. big deal in Europe. Uh, not to go Game of Thrones, but winter is coming. I know it's you know April, but we're going to get into May, June, July, and all of a sudden you're into winter. Yeah. This is going to really, one of the reasons they announced this deal with President Biden is they're trying to get this stuff online this summer because they're looking at the metrics. They're looking at the supplies. They're looking at the, the price of this stuff, and they're seeing winter coming. Talk about the human aspect of this, because when we're talking big policy, sometimes we lose that. This is how people heat their homes. This is how people cook their food, especially in Europe, which is gas dominant still. Uh, right. Talk about that part of it, because that's what's going to be the headlines in August, September, October, when the panic sets in, if we don't do something now to try to fix this, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, I feel like I'm in a place of luxury to just sit here and complain about higher gas prices and higher energy prices, but at least we still have it. It's still being piped you know, pumped into, you know, the gas stations and, and pumped into our homes. Um, but there are a lot of people in Ukraine and in the surrounding Central European regions that can't say the same and certainly won't be able to say the same in the winter if, you know, if the U.S. doesn't increase its exports and if we can't get this situation, well, maybe it's not our problem, but if someone can't get this situation in Ukraine under control. Um, and I think, you know, there's another aspect of natural gas that we haven't touched on yet, Andrew, which is that it's used to make fertilizer um, in a lot of instances, which of course helps grow crops. And we are currently in the U.S. already experiencing a bit of a food shortage um, and higher food prices. Um, and then globally, you know, without having natural gas to make fertilizer, you simply just cannot grow food. Um, and so while we may see it as higher prices in the grocery store, there are a lot of countries that rely on food exports from the U.S., from Russia, and from a lot of Western European nations. Um, especially, you know, those in like sub-Saharan Africa that simply just will not have food if we continue to see this shutdown and, and, you know, lack of supply of natural gas. Uh, welcome back to Twice on Sunday, Hurt Tells Recap Show. Been looking forward to this one. Uh, my good friend and yours, Stephen Kent. On the program, Stephen, whether you might not know it or not, was instrumental in me doing a podcast that turned into this program in the first place, and we thank him greatly for that. Longtime runner of Young Voices, he's now moved on to other things, but one of those other things was he wrote a book, How the Force Can Fix the World. It's a book about Star Wars, how the philosophy and lessons from it could better our culture and politic discourse and the way we do things in the real world even though that was written for science fiction. It's a great book. We had him on to talk about it, and it became a little bit more apropos because the owner of the rights to Star Wars right now, Disney, finds themselves in a little bit of cultural trouble right now with another controversy. So it all tied together. It was good timing, and we enjoyed our conversation with him very much. Our friend Stephen Kent, Star Wars, on the page, on the screen, and what we can do with it in real life right now on Hurt Tell. Uh, Stephen Kent joining us. You talked about this on your Substack. It's called This is the Way. That's a Mandalorian reference for those of you from Logan. You were talking about this on your Substack. You actually broke it down into an equation where you were talking about satisfaction and success and failure and making that into almost like a math equation and trying to, how would you say, maybe like get the mix of those three things right so that they come out right. It kind of goes mm -hmm. into that tradition, though, isn't it? It's like, well, if you know what, what satisfies you and you have a set of what a success is and then you know what a failure is because you didn't reach your success, that kind of gives you a, what do you want to call it, a balance point or a mooring point or a touch point mm -hmm. or a GPS point to know where you're at. Because like you said, the media environment now, it's coming at you all the time from all sides and it wants you to be immersed. That's the word you always hear is immersed in media. Can something like a, a just a simple equation like that of satisfaction, success, and failure, can that give you kind of a mooring to not get lost in all that? Yeah, well, that, that equation uh, fully is credited to Arthur Brooks, uh, formerly of the American Enterprise Institute and the author of a new book called From Strength to Strength, where he is basically outlining how our <clears throat> kind of consumer 
hyper-focused uh, attention economy has recategorized happiness as what you have plus what you want, plus what you want, plus what you want. <laughs> uh, and basically, you know, it's a never ending stream of things that you want and your happiness is never fully achieved. Um, <clears throat> the equation that is offered instead is happiness equals what you have divided by what you want. Um, and so this basically points you in the direction of doing a pretty rigorous audit of the things that you want and being grateful for the things that you have. Happiness is not going to be found necessarily in a bucket list uh, of things that you want to do by the time you die, uh, but more so in thinking about the things that you I don't know, not that you want to add to the list of the things that you've done, but what are the things that are left undone in your own life that already exist in your scope of influence? Not what are things that you need to go seek out and find to do, but what are things that are like right under your nose that need doing, um, that you have direct responsibility over? Yeah. Um, you talk about it that way. One of the other traditions, we talked about the Stokes a little bit, uh, a lot of Star Wars, George Lucas pulled from Japanese culture, specifically the samurai culture, samurai movies. In fact, for the folks that don't know, A New Hope was, we'll be generous and call it an homage to a movie called The Hidden Fortress. It's got a lot of parallels to the great Kurosawa films. In fact, there's that famous picture of Kurosawa on set at The Empire Strikes Back, which is a really cool pop culture reference for folks that get it. Um the the Japanese samurai tradition, um, not diametrically opposed to the Stokes, their thing was preparedness. You know, you're always prepared to do your duty. And then there was a humility that came of that, that kind of quiet strength sort of thing. That kind of goes through the Star Wars stuff, too. And you wrote about that on This is the Way also of one thing we can control, like you talked about before, is our own preparedness. We can't control, you know, war breaks out in Ukraine. We can't control inflation individually. But we can control our preparedness so when crisis does come up, we have some toolkit stuff to not get overwhelmed by it, don't we? Yeah, I mean, I think part of living in the modern world is feeling perpetually stressed out and burdened by a thousand inputs coming at you from every direction. And with that does not come empowerment. It really comes a, a huge creeping sense of powerlessness. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I had picked up from the Star Wars story, and particularly as a Star Wars fan, very, very simple uh, piece of advice here that is shared by Qui-Gon Jinn in Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace when he's talking to Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan senses uh, sort of a looming darkness. He has a bad feeling about something, which is a, a classic Star Wars-ism. Uh, but he says to keep your mind here and now in the moment where it belongs. And Obi-Wan responds, you know, but Master Yoda said I should be mindful of the future, not at the expense of the moment, is what Qui-Gon responds. And I think that that for me has been something that has informed how I try to think a, <laughs> think a lot about news consumption. There is a cost to every story you read about war in Ukraine, about war crimes being committed uh, by Russian soldiers. There's a cost to those things. We sort of think about information as this pure you know, it's it's neutral. It's like things that we're we're putting in. It's just data we're consuming, uh, but it doesn't have any sort of cost for us in our day to day lives. That's that's not true. Uh, the amount of time that you spend thinking about things going on overseas is time that you are not spending thinking about making sure that your bank account is in order, making sure that you have trimmed uh, certain investments from your portfolio to be more lean and mean for a potentially bad economy. What is the point of watching CNBC and seeing how bad uh, the housing market could get in the next couple of months, unless you are actually calling your mortgage advisor to see about uh, getting a refinanced rate. Like my point here is not to tell you to go buy gold or refinance your mortgage. Uh, it is just to say that there is not a neutral cost to inputting a ton of information about things going on around the world. You need to focus on the things that are actionable uh, and the things that are not lending to you having a better life, they are actually excess and indulgence, and they need to be trimmed from your diet. Yeah. And there's one of those philosophical things that you find, you find it in the Stoics, you find it in Eastern philosophy as well Is we don't do a real good job, especially as Americans, especially in the current media environment. We don't do a real good job with no, 
like we just don't know how to say no to incoming information or worse, we get into a rut where all we want is a certain kind of information. Is, is it, I hate to use this term because it's kind of nebulous, but people talk about mindfulness, but that's really the only term I can think of is you have to have a mindfulness of understanding where you're at because like, like I've pretty much cut out, even though it's kind of my day job, I've almost completely cut out network news in, in the US. Mm-hmm. I, I just had to because I can't do what I need to do and watch that stuff all the time. Because it just yeah, it, I mean it's it's, it's, it's kind of a, it it's kind of a centerpiece of of Star Wars. You hear it in almost every single uh, every single movie. Uh, someone will say, "Search your feelings," <laughs> and it's uh, it's they're saying that because when you have emotional reaction to a thing, a person, um, you know, somebody uh, makes a joke about your wife, right? Will Smith, uh, you know the feelings that wash over you are not coming from nowhere. And the right thing to do, the mindful thing to do is to try to spend time reflecting on the why of those feelings, what is informing where that thing is coming from. Um, I think probably with with Star Wars, the main thing that characters deal with in that book or in, the, in those movies, and I write about a lot in my book, is the fear of loss. So you have uh, Anakin Skywalker, who becomes Darth Vader, primarily is motivated by a fear of loss. He has bad dreams about losing people that he loves, and he wants to try to take certain actions to stop that from happening. Um, you know, Yoda in a in a great scene in episode three tells him that he needs to focus on his attachments and learn to be okay with letting go, um, learn to to let go of all that he fears to lose. Um, that is nice advice, but it's actually not very practical. It would be much more practical. <laughs> it would be much more practical for someone like Anakin to sit down with a, a medically uh, a licensed professional to actually talk to him about his really awful childhood where he was a slave, right? He grew up on Tatooine in slavery, uh, living a life where he had no autonomy, no ability to make choices. Every choice was made for him. His entire existence uh, was sort of marred by uh, his agency being completely taken away. And as an adult, go figure, he's obsessed with agency. He's obsessed with always being able to make sure that if something bad is going to happen or there's a possibility of something bad happening, that he has the ability to stop it. That doesn't come from nowhere. Someone like him needs to be mindful of his feelings and mindful of where he came from to inform who he is today. We all have to do that in our own lives and try to account for why do we feel the way that we feel when we read a certain story um, or we have a debate with our, our aunt or our uncle who's politically different than us? Why does it agitate us when they disagree with us or say something wild and out there? That'll do it for this edition of Twice on Sunday, our recap show. Uh, remember, if you subscribe, it's free YouTube, all the podcasting platforms, live streaming with our radio partner, Big Talker Network, every weekday, brand new episodes, full episodes, news of the day, turning down the noise of the news cycle. We always have a great interview. So until we talk to you again, wherever you and yours are across the street around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you are well fed. And we can't wait to talk to you again soon on Hurt Tell. All the music on Hurt Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. Oh.